Well, hi, good morning, and thanks so much for joining me in my shop here. Hey, it's November 3rd. It's voting day in the United States. Wow, what an exciting day. So, even Canadians get excited about the American election because uh, what happens in the United States uh, really has a major impact on what happens in Canada, too. So, okay, so I ended the last video discovering an open resistor. It was a little bit embarrassing for me since I should have found that much earlier in the process. To catch those things, I do I do two things. One is I do voltage tests of the plate and screens on all the tubes, or I actually take an ohmmeter, which I'm going to do in a minute, and just test every resistor quickly uh, in the radio. Um, I, I, maybe I did this with the other chassis and got it in my head. I did it with this one. In any case, should have found that a little earlier in the scheme of things, but that's okay. You know, uh, you find them when you find them. And uh, that's that's the main thing. So what I want to try here now is it just to, I, I've actually done this already. But I'm going to do it again, which I seldom I seldom I seldom do things like this. So this is just a demonstration, more or less, of, of how I quickly check the uh, resistors in a radio like this. And you know, there, this, there's a certain amount of invalidity to what I'm doing because the resistors are in the circuit here. So what I do is I set my meter on a high a high setting. 20 meg I don't I can't imagine there's a bigger than 20 meg resistor in this radio <laughs> that's for sure so open circuit looks like that short circuit would look like that there won't be any shorted resistors because my experience is resistors don't short they go high or they go open just like the one I found let's start with the one here so this one I just put in okay so right away I get a reading that's 270 K, that's exactly what this resistor is supposed to be. Perfect. Even though it's in the circuit. A lot of times these resistors are dead-ended in the circuit. They are going to tube uh, elements and the tube's not on. The radio's not on, right? So so it's open circuit. So you can do these readings. I hear a cat calling for me. So we'll start down at this end and we'll just we'll just go up. Now what I'm trying to do here is find a open resistor. I'm not so much trying to read them. Just trying to find an open one. So this is a this is the uh, 2200 resistor. Oh my gosh! Look at the reading on that. That's more like it. So on the 20 meg scale, this resistor 2000 ohm resistor is going to look like a zero. That's all you need to know. I'm not worried about the value of it because I tested it earlier. So okay, so that's a million. That's actually a million resistor there. This one up here is two million. This is a two million resistor. It's not. It's not open. So one hidden right here. And I'm not sure what it is because it's blocked from view. A million. So again, it's not open. This orange wire I installed to short out where the battery goes. The battery goes in here, and I've taken it out. So, so that's what this orange wire is. And there's a resistor here. This is a 270K. Okay, that's good. There's one here. This is the 50 ohm one here. So it's going to look like a zero on there. So you can quickly go through a radio like this. And here's, here's a resistor. You can hardly tell it's a resistor. And you can check for opens pretty quick. It's a very low low reading there, isn't it? It's a fairly large resistor. Here's a little guy here. This is red. This looks like uh, 20k to me. Well, 10 10k, 20k. It's not open. That's the main thing. So I've checked all the resistors in here now very quickly. None of them are open. Had I done this earlier on this radio, I, I would have found this for sure. But I didn't. And I guess I didn't do the voltage checks either, because, uh, yeah, actually I found it the hard way, that's for sure. Okay, so no more open resistors. Good. What do we want to do with this radio now? Now that I think it's working. Or is it really working? You know, it might be good to do a voltage check through here. Um, I had read of pretty high plate voltage on the 6B8, but I'll bet you it's down now. That the screen is involved. Um, yeah, might well do the same thing. Do a quick uh, voltage check through the radio. 
Okay, so just before I go a little bit further with this radio, uh, some kind viewer, maybe you, if your name is Lawrence, took pity on me and realized another viewer had written an excellent description of how the uh, 6B8 uh, six tube works in this, in this radio, and it is quite a curious thing. So I'm going to take advantage of this, uh, but just and we're going to go over the uh, what has been sent to me and try to figure out with that uh, added description just exactly how this radio manages to detect its audio signal. And uh, but before I do that, I got a comment about comments. <laughs> now many of you have been a viewer of mine, viewers of mine, maybe you for a long time. So you know my attitude about comments. It's it's. I don't read them. It's not that I'm against them. I'm certainly not. And I encourage people to make comments, say, even if they're a little bit critical, a, a little bit critical of what I'm doing, that's fine. I'm happy to know that there's a discussion among serious-minded viewers uh, trying to anticipate what's wrong with the project I'm working on or my approach to it or whatever it might be. That's just fine. All I'm doing here in my shop is showing you what I do I'm not showing you the right way to do anything. So the comments are great. And other people trying to learn how to do this kind of stuff or, or are getting stuck on their own projects or whatever it might be can benefit from the wise comments left on my video even though I'm not reading them. I'm not reading them for nine good reasons. Uh, I won't go into it, but uh, I have in the past. But there's some really good reasons for not reading the comments. The, the main one being they're quite stale by the time they make it on the video. I'm two or three hours down the road working on the radio and read comments about things that occurred and no longer matter. It's, it's just, the other thing is, you know, I have a life I'm trying to have outside of the shop here. <laughs> I, I am married and I have two cats, so can't be doing this 24-7, can't be distracted all day long by comments coming in from the thousands of videos I have on YouTube now. Okay, enough of that. Let's take a look at this uh, comment, and what I want to do is I'm going to read through it on the screen, uh, right on my email with you. Just read the words once. It'll be twice for me at that point. But then I'm going to put up the schematic and attempt to read through those comments and follow everything on the schematic and really get a grip on this. This is something really quite quite special they've done here. Uh, very uh, clever engineers have managed to make this radio work in a way that's unlike, well, I don't know if I've had another radio on my bench uh, that has this technique in it. And the reason probably is because they gave up on it. <laughs> they made a few radios this way and then tubes changed and everything changed and that was the end of trying to detect a signal using this, this radio's odd technique. So once again, thank you Lawrence and whoever Lawrence sent me the comment knowing I don't read them and whoever made the comment, unfortunately I don't have your name, but you're about to become minimally famous here. So let, let's take a look at this. Okay, so here's the email I got from Lawrence. Lawrence says to me, Jim, been watching your channel for a while and watched you puzzle over the unusual 6B8 detector. I stared at it for quite a while and couldn't explain it either. But one of your other viewers can, and he posted quite a detailed explanation, which, since I know you don't normally read comments, I have copied below. So if you don't really want to see it, read no further. <laughs> But it really is fascinating and uniquely clever circuit. Yeah, of course I have to read further. I'm not. I'm not going to figure out what they're doing with my my head. I gotta. I gotta read something. So here it is. This circuit is magic. Oh, okay. <laughs> it uses a 6B8 to amplify both the IF and the AF. Coming from L3, the 455 kilohertz IF passes the tube and appears amplified on the plate and into the primary of L4, the right side. To the 455 kilohertz, C15 is a short to ground, so the full brunt of the IF gets transferred to the secondary of L4. Okay, that, that's a common thing. Ground the bottom of a coil, so all the power is in the winding of the coil. There is, there it is rectified by the diode. So, uh, does it? To the rectified mishmash the capacitor what to the rectified mishmash the capacitor C16 has two phases okay so the rectified mishmash so what he's saying is once these signal is rectified it's it's a combination of a bunch of stuff because you got both the IF and the RF IF and the AF 
signals in here. Is that what he's saying? To the rect that's what the mishmash is. The capacitor has two faces. Okay, so it's uh, I, I guess in conjunction with our resistance, it can short the higher frequency, 455 kilohertz, to ground, but but is hardly any resistance to the audio envelope. Hardly any res seems backwards to me. Okay, so at R7, we lose the IF carrier, but are still seeing the audio frequency. Well, that's only if it's been rectified, and there's no rectification on my schematic. Or did I read it wrong? This signal now gets fed back into the grid of the 6B8 by means of R9. Pay close attention to the value of C13. It is small, so it will only short the remaining RF, but not the AF. That's kind of what I... Okay. So, the demodulated AF getting back to the grid of the 6B8 is amplified too. So, so basically, they're trying to use the 6B8 triode amplifier to amplify RF, rectify it, and then fire it back through as an audio signal. And then using capacitors and filters, pick off the audio and send it off to the, to the grid. And that's my interpretation here. To make the point clear, demodulated AF and undemodulated IF exist in parallel inside the pentode section. Maybe in combination might be a better word there. Or together, maybe exist together, maybe is the best word. The amplified audio is then decoupled to the audio output. That's what I was saying by C11 because, because the AF is only low frequencies and the capacitor C15 is no path to ground anymore. So C15, is that the one he mentioned up here? C7, C13. Okay, it's a different capacitor. In summary, it is a complex game of capacitances and their widely varying effect on widely different frequencies, the IF versus the AF. That allows designers to use the 6B8 to both amplify the undemodulated IF and then the demodulated audio frequency. I guess car enthusiasts may call it EGR signal processing. Okay, so I'm not a car enthusiast. That part went right over my head. Thank you, Lawrence, and the writer. Yes, I don't know who wrote that, but thank you. I knew something of the sort must be going on, but reading it in detail is very helpful. I'm just starting today's video. Actually, I'm doing it right now. So I'll use the description, run through the schematic, see how all this works. I could never figure it out on my own. I was just going to plow ahead and leave it as a mystery for another time. Okay, great. So let's do this. I'm going to uh, get this. Uh, I'm going to get this printed on a piece of paper, and then we're going to look at the schematic. We're going to go through this step by step and find out how this thing works. Or, or, or find out why it is I can't figure out how it works. Maybe that's what we're gonna figure out. Okay. Okay, I think I'm ready to go here. Uh, it took me a long time to get these two things on the screen at the same time, but I think this is the best way uh, to do this. So so the, the basic outline of what it says down here is you have an IF signal coming out here, going through this tube, getting amplified, Coming down through here, somehow, somewhere, that's run. the mystery is for me, it gets rectified. The audio is then doubled back through the same tube and then fed on over to the grid out here. So the signal goes through this tube twice, so to speak. Once at a high frequency, uh, 455 kilohertz, and the next time just the audio is going through. Well, I can't see it because I still don't see where the detection takes place. But let's go through this step by step see how this goes and I apologize ahead of time in case this isn't looking so good on your screen and all the gibberish on here all my all my personal crap here that I just couldn't get off the screen no matter what I tried so here we go the circuit is magic uh, okay it uses a 6b8 to amplify both IF and AF which I just said coming from L3 coming from L3 that's here 455 kilohertz IF passes the tube and appears amplified on the plate. So it passes through the tube and appears amplified on the plate and into the primary of L4 right side. Okay, so here's L4 right side. If we follow this back, there's the plate. So we know the 
signal coming out of this tube is going through this coil. The signal being the IF from here, the IF signal. So 455 through the grid, out the plate, through the, the right side of this coil. I did figure some of this out, didn't I? Now, to the 455 kilohertz, C15 is a short. Okay, C15. So here's C15. Um, we, we can't look at the size of it. We can guess it's fairly big. I think this was the 225 picofarad or something. Fairly big for a small capacitor. It's the ground. So the full brunt of the IF gets transferred to the secondary of L4. So what they're saying here is because this point is grounded out from an AC point of view, the entire signal is dropping. The entire AC signal is uh, dropping. It's not quite the right word but is uh, pressuring this coil. I can, maybe I can put it that way. The entire signal is pressured in this coil. You, you think, you know, uh, putting your capacitor to ground would cause it all to leak out. The pressure would disappear, but no, no, that's not how this works. So all built up here, as opposed to being built up here and maybe on a resistor like this. So you can think of this as bypass, not unlike this capacitor here bypassing this resistor. Kind of the same deal. Then it says, okay, so short to the ground, so the full brunt gets transferred. The full brunt gets transferred. So you maximize the transfer here instead of wasting some of the signal in a resistor like this. So now we've got something over here. Oh, oh, oh come back, come back. There it is rectified by the diode. Okay, so now now it's in here. Sure enough, it's hooked up to this diode. So in here, it's rectified. Not in here though, but in here. Okay, I, I got that. To the rectified mishmash, capacitor C16 has two phases, C16. Here. Oh, oh. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't really think about this one with two frequencies approaching it. thought about all these other ones, but I never thought about this one. All I thought was, this guy is here to resonate this coil at the IF frequency. He has two faces. It, it, this is really not the right way to say it. All capacitors have two plates or two faces. This is a little bit confusing. It has two functions, if you like, or because of the differences in frequencies going going at it, it has two apparent different behaviors. One behavior, it shorts the 455 RF to ground. C16. Shorts it to ground because this capacitor is here. So this isn't ground here. So C16 shorts it to this point which is signal ground because of this capacitor. Okay, to ground, but it has hardly any resistance to the audio envelope. So the audio... Yeah, so I think this is written just a little bit wrong here, because I think it's C15 that, that whose, whose reactance is varying so much. In one case, it's letting through the high, whoops, it's letting through the uh, the high frequencies. In one case, but audio can't get through here. So I think where he's written C16, maybe it's C15. We talked about C15 up here. So at R7, we lose the IF carrier. At R7. Here's R7. At R7. At R7, we lose the IF carrier, but still see the audio frequency. Okay, oh, I'm over on this side. Why is he talking about C16? We're over here. Did he mean C14? To the rectified mishmash, okay, so the rectified mishmash is in here. 
it's, it's not over here. It can't be these. It can't be these capacitors that he's talking about. It's got to be over here. Maybe he's got a different schematic. It shorts. So assuming he's talking about C14 here. It shorts the 455 RF to ground, but it's hardly any resistance to the audio envelope. Well, that wouldn't be very good. Because then it would be just... See, that doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. If it's shorting the high frequency, how can it be hardly any resistance to the low frequency? So the way I would put this is, at, at high frequency, this looks like a short, especially with this resistor sitting here. So high frequency going this way. And down on this wire, further along, we can look at it, is uh, big resistors here, big resistor here. Okay, so, so at audio frequencies, though, the, the audio, the detected audio that's in here now, or the potential detected audio, can I put it that way? The, the audio that's almost ready to go to the grid of the output tube is sitting in here, almost ready because it still has RF in it. If I get rid of the RF, it will go here. You dump the RF out here, and as, you know, there's various ways of looking at how these things work. And I'm saying it dumps the RF out, and other, you might say, well, this capacitor is busy filling the valleys and making this smooth, or you could look at it differently. But in any case, uh, fill the valleys, fill the valleys. But it won't knock out the audio. So the audio is sitting here now. So now the audio, the audio, we travel on here, come up here. And boom, right back into the, yeah, right back in to the grid. Coming through, now it's coming out in audio, audio, there's an audio frequency in here. Audio frequency doesn't care about this transformer because uh, it, it, it can't make it across, even though they put what looks, I guess this is supposed to represent a slug. A slug here, a slug. So, so the audio also, when it looks at this capacitor, it sees this as um, high impedance because it's low frequency, but it can look at this and come right through here, right through. So the audio comes through here, doesn't transform because of the inefficiency of the transformer uh, at that frequency. Audio is here now. This guy's too small to drain it into the chassis. This guy's too big. C11, C15, how do they compare? C11, so C11 is a fairly big 0.02, and C15 is a, well, it's a 350 pico, much, much smaller. So the preferred path is this way for audio. Uh, R10, what's R10? R10 is a mega ohm, big one. So the audio do doesn't pay attention to this. Audio is going right here, and out it goes. So, so now the, the question kind of becomes, so, yeah, okay, so I think what they have to do is they have to take the output from this tube and do two different things with it at this point. And so by arranging this, they've been able to do that. The, the advantage of this whole deal is there's one tube less in this radio. Because normally this would be a simple amplifier, and then you'd put the fancy tube over here. So you, you, you'd run the RF through here, and then the audio would be developed in this non-existent tube, and then pushed on. Well, they've managed to do both with one tube. And that's why it's called magic. So there's some problems here in, you know, I, th I think, you know, I hate to say this, but from, from my point of view, I think there's a little bit of a problem here with some of these capacitors. Um, so sorry to be not quite in agreement. So at R7, we lose the IF carrier. At R7, we lose the IF carrier, yeah, 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 because it's, is it because it's being uh, snuffed by this capacitor, and you're left with uh, but still see the audio frequency, right, right, fed back by means of R9, there we are, R9, 
Pay close attention to the value of C13. It is small, so only short any remaining RF, but not AF. C13. So C13. Oops, 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 oops. I am losing control. Let's put this down here. C13, did it say? Pay attention. There it is. What? That's way over here. What? What's the deal on C13? Pay close attention to the value of C13 exclamation mark. It is small, so it will only short any remaining RF, but not AF. I see, because, because the audio is coming up through here, and if this capacitor was big enough, whoosh, over it would go and be gone. Did you like that sound effect there? So normally you put you know, a fair size capacitor in here, as big as you want to spend money on, to, to drop this to a signal ground. But if you just were kind of went a little overboard, you'd knock the audio out here too. Okay, well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, hats off to the engineers back then who came up with something clever to make their radio $6 cheaper than the competition. And put out a circuit here that I'll bet you other engineers, when this came out, other radio engineers looked at this for quite a while, just like I've done. Uh, maybe, they, uh, maybe the guys who designed this revealed how it operated right away. But you have to be fairly clever to sort this out, and I guess I'm just not quite that clever. So thank you again for writing this. This has helped me get through this whole thing. Even if I got a little bit wrong here, you know, in terms of exactly how it works, I got it close enough. I can certainly troubleshoot all this, I can test it, I can figure out what should be there and what shouldn't be there. And so C13 is small. Well, how small is it? 110. Well, you know, to me, small means 2, 3, 5, 10 picofarads. 110. But small, because typically, I think in this position, you would find a 0.01 or something like that. Very neat. Very cool. Now yesterday I was doing signal tracing and I traced the signal to this pin and found it weak. And I was making a mistake there uh, because I was still listening to the original you know, antenna signal when at this point I should have been listening to the IF frequency. I should have switched my uh, tracer. But at this point I think the radio was operating all the way through. Um, Maybe what today will be is just making sure that the radio is operating properly. Maybe not resolve its alignment as such, but just convince myself there isn't another defective part in here. Something like that. So we should do voltage checks on this tube for sure. Because before I was getting 200 up here instead of 75, but this would have been a zero. No current draw down here. No screen current with this resistor open. But now there's screen current that may, I'm not exactly sure how, but that, that may affect this voltage up here. Let's find out. Okay, so, whew. what am I hoofing about? Uh, so I'm able to monitor my audio levels and things like that while I'm working here, if I pay attention enough to them. Except that last bit I just did, I couldn't tell at all if any of it was being recorded, if the audio was happening. And when I flip my screen to here, I could see all that again. Isn't that uh, just a little background nonsense that goes on? Let's operate the radio to start off with in as normal a way as I can. So there's no equipment. I, I, yeah, I mentioned I put in the short circuit here, so I can turn this over now. You know what I got to do soon? I got to put the string on this thing. Oh my God. Maybe that's what I'm going to do today struggle away on the string. So given all this new information, I think I gotta deal with the string next. So let's play the radio, hear the thing work, rejoice, rejoice over it, and then uh, bear down on the string. The string. So the string, what makes the string challenging is us humans can only tolerate so much. <laughs> when you work on a string on some of these radios, it takes you right 
right to the limit. And now I know for sure the switch is not thrown for this antenna. Oh, it's not ever sound like a radio, eh? Fantastic. Not quite as sensitive. Okay, we're still stick tuning here. And then I'll, we'll see what happens, and I'll go get the. Uh, So I'm going to run and throw the switch to make sure my antenna is, is on. And I'll be right back in. Oh, I don't know. Had to run past the TV, look at the screen, of course the American election is on. I don't understand why there's so many lineups in American elections. Um, we, here you're in Canada, we, we don't face lineups. I mean, if we do, it's just a couple of people. It's nothing. It's just a few minutes. It's nothing. How come there's always, all my life, all I've seen are these huge lineups in American elections? And none here. No, no lineups here. Anyway. Here we go. Hey, one, one last thing. American elections cannot pass international election standards because the people who are voting don't face the same thing everywhere. So if you vote in one state, the system works on one way, and the lineups are a certain way, the polling booths a certain way. If you vote in another state, it's quite different. That negates the election. All voters should be facing exactly the same thing. If I'm facing a two-minute lineup here where I am, people all across Canada should be facing two-minute lineups or something similar to that. What was that? Okay, enough talk about elections. We've had two provincial elections here in Canada just in the last few weeks. Come and gone. Boom. Just like that. Uh, antenna's connected, so we're going to try to tune something in here. So despite the fact I can't pick up a station, I mean, this radio sounds like it's working great actually. Station right here. There we are. strange volume control because it's not simply a resistor, uh, a variable resistor, uh, grounding out the antenna. It's tied right back to the local oscillator in, in some weird configuration which I, I only looked at briefly and then uh, brain cells started coming out of my ears so I stopped looking at it. Um, sure seems to behave weird too but radio is working so you know what I think this is all about now? All about the string. Oh boy. Okay, power off, because we certainly don't need any power to do a string. The lucky thing is, I have another radio here with the string on it. So I can look at how the string is done properly, because I don't have a stringing diagram. And what was in my head is not right. Let's get the other radio here. So the, the challenge with this, uh, wow, is trying to work in this wheel here. Now, luckily, part of it is exposed right here. Hey, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. I can get at that. So we, we can actually see how it's done, too. So there's a couple ways strings can be done in here. 
what they've done with this string, the string is actually a loop. They've, they've tied the ends together. That knot is sitting right here. And then the knot is on the spring. You can see a little bit of a spring there. And then the spring is, well, it's just, can I, can I get this all the way around to reveal that? Or the spring, yeah. So like even the spring connection, although this is in the way for your view, I can see it there. This is actually not that bad. So one approach would be, would be for me to remove the string from this radio and measure it and then duplicate it with new string. I'm not going to do that. A really important thing to figure out is how are they doing this? So i got to count the number of times around and, and that's not the easiest thing. So we're going around once, around twice, and then out the bottom. They come down around once, around twice, and out the bottom. They're coming down from this side. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the string is really roughed up right in here. And the string appears to be running into itself here. No, maybe not. But this string's ready to break right in here. So you see the size of the spool down here, too? So as you tune the radio, the string will walk across the... Uh, walk across to the other side. In some radios, this is big enough for the whole string to just walk across, back and forth. And if somehow it got out of the center here, if somehow it, instead of being here, it was way over here, and then it's going to try to go further, it has a wall to climb up, this curved surface. And all this being nice and smooth here and beautiful, the string will slide back. Now, can I possibly make this radio demonstrate that? Probably not. Not without breaking the string. In other radios, there isn't so, so large an area here. And the string more or less sits in the middle and slides the whole time because it has these, these curved walls to try to climb up. It can't climb up it. So in trying to climb up it, it means push pressure and push the string back. In a radio where you can't see any of this, you're just you're, maybe you're looking at one at a yard sale or something and you're turning this dial and feeling it. There's a few things you can figure out just from doing this. I mean, is, is it working at all? Like, is the string even there? I mean, you can figure all that out. But often when there's trouble down in here, for instance, the string can't slide on the spool the way it has to slide, then the string will climb up and then fall over onto itself, right down in here, and pinch itself and, and, and basically lock it off or make a nut, make a knot of a sort. So as you're turning this, you get to a point where it suddenly it starts locking up, but if you push it a little harder, you can make it go a little further, but then it wants to come back. It's right in the middle here. My advice in those situations, don't push it. You can maybe walk it back and go forward further, and walk it back and go forward further if you really want to. But if you get to the point where the string is, is, is going over on top of itself, you're getting really close to breaking it. You keep pushing it, the string tension is going up. The reason you can move it a little bit is the spring is compensating on the back. And if you don't realize this, you'll think, oh, it must be a little stuck. I'll just push it harder. String broken, and then you're facing what I'm facing. So uh, that's the deal. I wonder if, you know what? I have a whole bunch of string diagrams. I wonder if there's one for this this guy. And why would I care? I have a string right in front of me. I don't think I care. Okay, uh, before I start doing this, I'm going to go and relax a bit by watching television. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah, it's another country. It's not my country. It's another country. I'm going to go watch a little TV, change my headspace, then come back in here and... Uh, start working on putting the string on. We'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see how my mental health is <laughs> as I do this. And back in here after just a couple of minutes of television. There's no way I'm going to be able to relax my brain staring at that TV today. Okay. The big challenge with this is getting this the right length 
and then you also you, you can't you know, figure out the length tie it into a loop and then think you're going to stick it on there it's got to get around this this guy here so you have to kind of fit it on and figure out its length then remove it potentially tie it up or somehow tie it up in place oh my gosh this is really not going to be too easy here how would I do this and I start it so <laughs> I guess in a factory situation they know what the length is supposed to be they measure it out they tie it off and cut it they before they do that they get it around here I mean they do it and some guys done one radio after another all day long and he's figured out everything about it I guess I got to go around this wheel first Even that's not easy to do. Okay, let me get some tools out of here. I'm going to need my oh-so-important pusher-puller. So this is a tool I bent with this odd-looking hook shape here. So I can hook a string and pull it, or I can hook it and push it. Pusher-puller. Other tools, uh, grippers. Ripping. Um, sometimes when you're doing this, you're going to want to fix the tape, fix the string to where it is temporarily because you've only got two hands. So in order to do that, I need some tape at the ready. This is about protecting my mental health during this affair. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little loop in it, feed it in here. Hook it, hook it on something. That'll be the starting point. Bring it out, wind it. Oh, this isn't going to work at all. This is just not going to work. So uh, what I'm thinking too is I could get the string on here. I could do the knot up here. Since there's no pointer on the string right now, I can then slide the string until the knot appears here and then attach the uh, spring to put the tension onto it. So in that case I would literally be installing the string just right on here, not worried about it going down in the little, the little hole there. And then we just pull the spring out. How, how far is that? Uh, this, this barely went in the hole, come to think of it. Yeah, the string is hardly pulled in. And, uh, I've got lots of springs. I can certainly put any. I, I, spring, spring is not a problem. Okay, so if we do that, what exactly are we doing? We're going around the wheel as if it's not there. down from the wheel, around the outside, through the back. Uh, and if you've never done one of these, then you don't realize what it is I'm so concerned about, my mental health. <laughs> but if you've done one of these, you're probably concerned about my mental health during this. goes up all the way around out the bottom okay so I'm gonna want to steady the string here so it doesn't uh, slide through I'm also trying to preserve this string this is expensive string I actually ordered this string from Australia it looks like I have an awful lot of it still uh, the thing about this string is it has no stretch you need to use string without stretch. Okay, 
can pull a little bit on it now. We're going to go around the wheel. This is where the puller part is really helpful. Pusher part, pusher part. Around the wheel. We go. Oop, didn't make it. So I got it around the, the, the shaft, but that's okay for now. Go around the wheel, come up the other side, go across, pulleys. I got the taper, I'm going to tape this right now just a little bit. Okay, whoop. So I got to get this on the wheel here. I can't make a measurement without it, without it not being really on the wheel. Okay, did this actually go right? Yes. Comes up. around get out of there whoops Yes, a lot of quiet whispering goes on here. This is all about getting a measurement. Getting a reasonably accurate measurement. Come so loose. Okay, okay, we got it to here now. Okay, we're around the wheel. Around the wheel. On the pulley. We're not actually on the pulley. Pulley. Come where do we go from here now. We go down, go around, we come up the other side. Is that right? We go down. Wait a minute. Come over the top, around the spool, up from the bottom of the spool. Once in a while, a string, and I've been fooled by this before, the string will travel in contact with this wheel briefly. Like, um, I don't know how to explain it exactly. It'll look like it's going around the wheel when it's actually just running along it for a moment. I think that's what's happening here. So there's, there's two on this side going down, one coming up. Okay, let's just do it this way. Back, back from this wheel. The string goes. I think it does exactly that. It just comes up and kind of rubs against this wheel. So if I saw it, so to bring the string up, um, first I gotta lock it here. Somehow, a little bit. So we won't go anywhere. Do it from here. Okay, I put masking tape on the front face of this radio wheel. Bozo, what are you doing, man? Oh my god, that's a stupid move. Duh! Okay, nothing bad happened, though. But I'm, I'm upset because I could pull the... Uh, pull the... Pull the words off or whatever on the front here. Oh, I almost did that, too. Wow. Okay, don't pull on this. Don't pull on this. I gotta lock this better. It's usually right about this point that the string falls off everything and you have to start over. And this, this is where the, uh, the tension does come. Um, give me a good clip here. Don't know if this is a good clip. It's holding nothing. Okay. 
Okay. Now. Where am I? So I'm coming down here. You want to come up past. You want to come up and tie to the string here. Is that right? So we come up. What is it really doing on that wheel? All right. So although it comes in contact with this wheel, it's not going around it. So that that's what I got to do. So I got I got to bring the string up and tie it here tightly. Of course, you know that's that's challenging too because you need uh, you need some slack to tie the knot. Lots of guesswork here. So we can reduce the guesswork. Um, how am I going to get this up here? Okay, freeze it there. Pull it. me blowing the string into position so I can grab it. <laughs> uh, it needs a third hand and blow. Okay, so that didn't go right. I got caught on the uh, volume control. It got caught on the volume control. You certainly don't want that happening. So I got to do it again. Just catch it right here. Okay, so this is the guy we want to tie to this piece here. So I can bring it over. And what we'll do is we'll mark the knot spot. The knot spot. Now this is with no additional string tension. Spring tension. Chances are when I tie this, things are going to get loose anyway. So we'll assume that I can solve the spring tension even if the string is really tight. I succeed in doing that. Let me get a marker here. So I want to put a mark on. Come on. There we go. Put a mark on both strings where the knot should go. And it should go here. Okay, so if it sounds like I'm, you know, I'm really doing good here, and I, I get the impression I'm doing really good so far. <laughs> Don't be fooled by it. So now I want to tie the knot there, slip the string so the knot is in the hole. Actually, it doesn't even matter if it comes loose. Doesn't matter. This also gives me a uh, string uh, cutting. String cutting. Uh, how many times have I done this where I've gone and cut the strings and then found out I'm a millimeter too short or something stupid like that? That's happened too many times. A little excess here. Okay, and I got to tie a knot with those red, red guys in the same spot. If I do a real good job of this, the string will be really tight. through. What happened? My knot didn't, didn't really knot anything. Yeah, that's perfect. Looks just like what I wanted. I think I've shortened the string even more. Okay, so we, we're not going to... Okay, now Let's see what we can get out of that. 
Okay, so now I gotta get this hooked on over there. And we'll see what kind of tension is in it, if any. There may be no tension. If the string is bigger than needed, there'd be no tension. If the string is significantly smaller than needed, the tension will be in me. Now with my pusher puller. hooks. This one I'm going to grab it and kind of tighten it up. And this one I'm going to try to put it in place. There you go. Like this will be loose right until the last minute and then it'll be super tight. This is looking really good. If I can just do this, I get the pusher part here. Get on there. Get on. What's the problem? The string is just caught on the edge here. Come. There it goes. It just popped in. Okay, now I'm going to disconnect my tool here. Bingo! The one thing that's different about this right now is the uh, this string here and behind here is supposed to be laying up against here. That'll put a lot more tension onto it. How much tension is there? So I'm going to grab the string by pushing it down in here just to feel what it's like. And we'll turn this a little bit. Hey, you know what? That's perfect. Okay, now we got to slip slip the knot. No, oh, first I got to tie tie the knot, tie the knot tighter, tie the knot with another knot. Then often I put a little bit of glue on on this kind of thing. Okay, we'll do it like the doctors do. Okay, now, quickest way to the opening, right down this way. So the thing is, when you, when you pull, when you pull on one of these strings, like I'm pulling this way, right? You pull, you increase tension. Believe it or not, pushing is what you want to do. It's a continuous string. Let's see if I'm a liar. Push. I can hold the capacitor in place because I want to put the knot by the hole there. Come on around. You can do it. Yeah. Careful, I'm going to take it right off the uh, wheel. I don't want it to come off the wheel at this point. There we go. Mr. Knot. Oh, I should have cut the excess. Whoop, whoop. So now, can I, I can't work from here. i got to work on the other side. Duh. That means the knot's got to go all the way down. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Let's let's yeah. Let's turn the uh, wheel where it should be, way right over here. How come it looks so inaccessible now? I thought I thought. Oh, <laughs> you never know, right? So in this radio, when the capacitor is closed. The opening is here. In this radio, when the capacitor is closed, the stupid opening is over here. So, okay, does it really matter? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does because when I have the capacitor open, it cannot access in here. possibly do it over here. Where does the... So the... I am looking for where the spring attaches. It's way up in there. 
get the spring to attach and show up. Oh, I don't think I can do it over here. Come on, what are you doing here? So what's happened is that they've locked this wheel on in a, on the shaft in a different position from where they locked this one. So I could unlock this. You know what? No, you can't. It looks like it's all riveted. Yeah, there's no unlock. There's no set screw. There's nothing. It's, it's riveted. Hang on, camera. I know you're getting upset too. Oh, don't fall over. Hey, is it tight enough the way it is? How do you like that? It is. But it's not locked to the wheel, so that's no good. We need we need the spring, the spring locking. Okay. Well, uh, um, let me get my springs, and we'll we'll pick a spring. We'll pick a spring to go in there. Okay. So uh, most of these uh, brand new springs are all really too big. Here's, here's a used one out of another radio and I think this is going to work okay even though it's been sprung a little bit. I need a pretty long one. My options are hook this on the wheel and then try to hook this on the string. Hook this on the string and then try to hook it on the wheel. You know I think hooking it on the string and then trying to pull it to the wheel is actually This way, though. You know what? So what is actually so? Even though this isn't exposed over here, what is is where this grabs the inside of the wheel, the little tank. So let's move the knot up here. Come on, little knot. There. The knot can't be up here. Yeah, I can't. This knot has to be here, right now. That's a long ways away. What if I leave the knot right here? What if the knot were there? Where does it go? Goes down, goes around the wheel. That's the end of that. Go back this way. It's hardly look at. There's hardly any travel here. You know, it's only 180 degrees. I could leave the knot traveling around on the wheel. Okay, can I? Maybe I can actually slide it all the way. Jim, can you slide it all the way? Sure can. Will actually right, right past. Fiddly stuff, isn't it? Yes, sir. Listen to him mumble as he does this stuff. Okay, I'm gonna pull, push this the other way now. Attach the spring, pull the string there. Then I do that and see what happens. Maybe, maybe that's what I should do. Leave the knot where it is. I think it's fine. Try to get this on. How am I going to do that? How am I ever going to get it in there? And then I got to pull it in such a way that it will grab the string. Oh boy, can I, can I work right up through here? I can. Okay, I got to get this on over here. I did it. And put this on the string. I did that. Oh, holy smokes, man. Man alive will be something extra in my check this month. Better check and see if it works first. Uh oh, what's going on here? This isn't right. Okay, now I gotta give up the extra money on my check already. This, this didn't work right. Didn't really grab the string. Okay, now it's grabbing the string. Yeah, what's wrong here? Uh, 
how, how something's not right here because as I turn this down see the string is now running straight in that's the end of the, end of the road there but what have I done wrong here supposed to come down and go around the wheel. These two radios aren't strung the same way. That can't be the case. I must have made a mistake. I must have made a mistake. So the problem is yeah, this goes down. This looks exactly the same as this. I mean, that was my intention up the back side. So because the gap is here and on the other radio the gap is on kind of the other side. Because of that I'm, uh, I'm upset. Um, Creepers, creepers, is there just nothing this radio can't make difficult? This one, when the gap comes over, it stops there, just as this string is beginning to go straight into it. This one, where the gap is way over yonder. The wheel couldn't be turned right. What happened? I'm going to take a guess what's happened between these two models of radio is they figured out if they do this wheel differently, they make the string operation go just a little easier and they save. A minute or two on the uh, assembly line. You know, Fred, if we just did this a little different, it would be a lot easier. Why don't we start doing it a little different and make it easier? Good idea, John. It'll be a little extra in your envelope, but uh, you know that Jim guy in 2020? This is going to confuse him all to heck. So close and yet so far. Is there another gap? Is there two gaps when I'm working in one? No, there's only one gap. Only one gap. Rivet it on. Break time. And if I can keep my head about me when all the radios around me are telling me I can't put a string on a radio for crying out loud. <laughs> what? Yeah, so I'm going to stop the video, stop working at this point, um, because, you know, I did a great job here, which completely flopped. I'm going to have to do this all over again. Uh, I can't follow what's going on here exactly, obviously, and I don't have any stringing instructions, although, although if you had the proper stringing instructions, um, it couldn't be applied to both of these radios. Who knows? Anyway, that's it for me today. Thank, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, tomorrow I will either just cut this string off if I figured out another way to do it, or I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't, because no easy solution has come to mind here. This gap, it just, it just can't, yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah. <laughs> Okay, enough, enough, enough. You see, I'm at my wit's end here. That, that's what happens with strings. I'd highly recommend if you are going to work on a string on a radio that you be prepared for about an, 45 minutes to an hour of work and then stop <laughs> because by then the tears will be flowing. So, okay, thanks a lot for watching and uh, go at it again tomorrow.